Ladies and gentlemen, you will see that I will be using the back screen a lot this evening, but I would like to introduce you to our first speaker, Ms. Sikinder Singh Cassidy. Sikinder Singh Cassidy is founder and chairman of Joyous. Prior to founding Joyous, she spent 18 years as a leading consumer internet and media executive at global and early stage companies including Google, Amazon, Polyvor, Yodli, and News Corporation. A graduate of the Richard Ivey School of Business at the University of Western Ontario, Canada, she has most recently served as CEO and Chairman of the Board at the leading social commerce site, Polyvor, and CEO in residence with Excel Partners. From 2003 to 2009, Sikinder was a senior executive at Google, president of the Asia Pacific and Latin American regions. Sikinder currently serves on the board of TripAdvisor and Formspring, and as an advisor to Twitter and Princeton University's Department of Computer Science. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Sikinder Singh Cassidy. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I know uh, the Sikh American Chamber of Commerce worked, I think, over the last two years to try and get me to this event, and I was so uh, disappointed not to make it last year and so delighted to make it this year. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Um, so I understand that the theme of this, this year's gala is really about shared success and shared community. Uh, and it was interesting because when the organizers called me and asked me to think about what I might want to speak about, it was really interesting and fun to be able to like reframe the lens of some of the things I think are really important from a leadership perspective into the people who taught me those lessons. Um, and it was fun for me to be able to do it. So with that, um, hopefully you find a little bit of what I've done useful. It's on the back, it's on the back screen. I'll be totally happy if you look there. Um, and really, what I'd love to do is actually share with you a perspective on leadership um, from the people who taught it to me. Um, so I'm sure I'm not the only one who would basically tell you that when people ask me who my business hero is, um, and my, in fact my hero, it would be my father. Um, he passed away in 2000, but there is no doubt that from a, per from a personal and from a professional perspective, he was the single biggest influence in my life. The single biggest. And when people ask, you know, well, if you had a, a lesson to give on leadership, well, where does it start? I always say it starts with this one thing which is you should know your trademark strength. So if I were to ask you in the room, how many of you know your trademark strength? How many of you could put up your hand and tell me what it is in one or two words? So I saw one hand go up, maybe two. And that's really interesting, right? Because when you go about building a company, or in fact building anything, you know, if you're the leader of that thing, how can you start without knowing what you're good at? Not just what you're good at, what you're uniquely good at because you're about to build an entire organization around it. But if I think about who gave me that lesson, it is undeniably my father. So my father was a doctor in St. Catharines, Ontario. He uh, was born in East Africa and immigrated when he was young. But he wasn't just a doctor, he was also an entrepreneur. He really loved running his medical practice. He ran it with my mom for 30 years together before he passed away. And not only did he love running a medical practice, well, my goodness, he loved finance, he loved stocks. He bought AOL in the early 1980s, far before I was in the internet industry. My father was buying AOL, AOL stock, <laughs> and trading it on the stock market when he was seven years old. Right? So when I think back to that growing up, when I was seven, he, he taught me how to do his income taxes. By the time I was 11, I was doing all of his books. And I can only tell you that early on, probably as early on as 12, 13, 14, like, my love of business was being fostered by my father. And he was steering a path for me, and, and I think looking at what I was good at and helping it take shape, right? Long before I knew what it was, my father knew what it was. But by the time I was 17, 18, 19, I can tell you, I had an indelible sense that not only was I going to go into business, but that I had a purpose in this world, right? And that maybe that purpose would manifest itself through my energy or through my mind, which, you know, loved science and writing and math and all of these things. But that was all fueled by my father. You know, and so whether it's right or wrong, from very early on, he made me believe I was here for a reason. And I had something to give. And that I had some sort of gift. Right? 
So he, he imbued that in me. And I think when I say to business leaders all the time, if you're going to be great, right, you need to understand what you're uniquely good at. And I think my father saw that in me, and he fostered it. Right? And so very early on, like if I were to think about where my trademark strength came from, energy or passion or love of entrepreneurship, I can tell you it came from my father. Right? And from my father seeing it in me, and then really you know, driving it to the fore. Next slide, please. So now we dial forward a few years, and my father has you know, given me this sense that I can do anything. Um, my family is very conservative, you know, like many Indian families are. You know, I want to go to New York, and I want to work for Merrill Lynch, and I want to work on Wall Street. And my father is the person who says, go, go. Buy a train ticket and go down. And I bought a train ticket, and I went down to Merrill Lynch, and I got myself an interview, and I got myself a job. And that's how I got to, New that's how I got to Wall Street. Right? Because they didn't, the Merrill Lynch at that time didn't come up to Canada to recruit. And so I'm there, and then I intersect with another major person who influenced my career, a guy named Henry Michaels, affectionately called Henry Hank the Crank Michaels. Right? That's what Henry would call himself. And he was a managing director of Merrill Lynch. And very early on, you know, Henry was my first boss. Right? And I won't tell you, you know, what it took me to get that job at Merrill, but suffice to say, it didn't go smoothly. It was a long, fight for me to get the job I wanted at Wall Street. So when I finally got there, I felt like I had something to prove. And my very first boss was this guy, Henry. And he basically sat me down on my very first days. And he gave me this assignment. And he just told me the story of how when he was an analyst, he just worked harder than anybody else. Right? And they used to call him Hank the Crank right? as a joke. But of course, he was one of Merrill Lynch's youngest managing directors. And I got to work for him. And Henry pretty quickly inundated me with work, right? And interesting work. And he didn't put anybody between me and him. And that was really interesting because I was 24 years old and I was working for somebody who was many, many years older. And typically you get layered when you're on Wall Street and they put two or three people in between you. And Henry just let me work directly with him. And he gave me this chance to prove myself. And I learned that in fact, I've always been that guy. I have always been that person who works harder than they need to. I can't tell you why, right? It annoys some people that I'm always working, <laughs> you know, but it just is what it is. That's who I am. And all I can tell you is when you think about leadership, and in fact, those of you who are, who've already achieved success, you know it to be true. And those of you who are thinking about how to be more successful, there is no substitute for working harder than anyone else. There's just none. So when my teams complain to me about how hard they work, I'm like, mm -mm, guys, <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Your job is, in fact, to work really hard, right? really hard. And, and I think when I think about the person who fostered that in me, it was undoubtedly Henry. Right? So I had it, he fueled it. Next slide, please. So it's interesting, because then you know, I go on to have a pretty good career at Merrill. They send me to London which is great. When I'm in London, I decide that I want to move from investment banking to working you know, for a big media company. I end up working for News Corp. I, it's, uh, I worked for their satellite uh, television division called B Sky B, British Sky Broadcasting, which at the time was the world's largest satellite broadcaster, for their CEO and COO. And I've been there a couple years, and I really, really want to be an entrepreneur, because my father seeded that in me. And I don't know how. I'm 26 years old. So I quit my job, and I moved to Silicon Valley. And I end up there early in, in, 90, in 97. Um, and when I get there, I have one job experience which isn't so great, but pretty quickly, I end up working for four Indian entrepreneurs. One of them is this guy, Venki Harinarayan, who's an investor in my current company. Venki at that time is a young grad from Stanford, computer science grad, he started a company, and within six months, he sells it to Amazon for $120 million. And Venki has gone on to become a great, great entrepreneur in the Valley. He's a serial entrepreneur, he's many exits. But the thing that attracted me to Venki when I got to Silicon Valley was I sat down in this room of four male Indian entrepreneurs. <laughs> it was my first experience in the Valley, my first experience working for somebody who was Indian. But you know, what attracted me to Venki was not his company, it was him. He was just that smart. And he knew things so incredibly deeply. Right? He, and, and so his tag phrase for his first company was, the database is the internet, 
And in fact, the company went out and grabbed information on the prices of different products and was a price comparison engine. And when Amazon bought it, Jeff Bezos bought it. He bought it for that technology. You know, but, but what I learned when I went to Jungle Lee was Venki gave me the, the opportunity to be what's called a business development person. Um, somebody got on the phone and convinced, in the early days, online merchants to give Jungle Lee their data, their online data. And I started, and I didn't have any experience. I had some experience selling from my college summer days, but not that much. But I got on the phone, and I just started to call people like Barnes and Noble and J. Crew and what have you. And it turns out we were able to be really successful in that. And when Amazon bought the company, Amazon bought the company for that asset. Because Jeff Bezos, in the early days of Amazon, had a vision that Amazon should be a place where you not only bought the stuff they had, but if he didn't have the product, he should show you the merchant who did. So that's why I bought the company. And I was the biz dev person who was doing those deals. So what I was doing turned out to be really valuable. So early on, I got my start in my career in Silicon Valley knowing one thing, which is called business development. And I always say, in Silicon Valley, the most powerful people are engineers. The second most powerful people are people who know how to raise money. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, because even engineers value people who know how to make their technology commercially viable and get somebody to buy it. And so it was very interesting that my first experience being successful in Silicon Valley was as a salesperson, as a business development executive. And I stayed in the business development role for the vast majority of my career. I went on to start my own company, a company called Yodely, right after uh, Amazon, as the business, VP of business development. So I did all our first deals to license our technology. I got hired by Google to do the first deals for local and maps, to launch local and maps as a product, the product we use on our phones today. And then I went over and I ran revenue for everything between China and Brazil. Right. So all of those countries reported to me. But it was all a revenue producing job. So people are always like, how did you get to be a CEO? How did you get to be a president? And I'm like, simple. I took what I was good at, business development, and I just kept doing it. And I built my reputation on it. And so from a very early age, including in, the, in Silicon Valley, I spent 18 years bringing in revenue and bringing in partnerships. And that was the path to success. So when people always ask me, you know, how do you, how do, you do something? I'm not a big believer in breadth. I am a big believer in depth in the idea that if you know something deeply, that knowledge is powerful, right? And so you can flip from thing to thing to thing. But when you look at great careers, they're built on deep knowledge. Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell says the same thing in his book, right? Outliers. It's all about 10,000 plus hours at one thing, right? I saw that in Benke. He gave me the chance for it to be business development. And in fact, I built my career on it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I go on from Jungle Lee and Amazon to starting my own company, a company called Yodley, which we'll come to in a moment. And after I've been at Yodley for five years and we've raised a lot of venture capital, you know, I decide that I am thinking about what I'm going to do next. And luckily for me, a guy named Omid Kordistani, who's Google's chief business officer, gives me a call. And at the time, Google is about 1,000 people. And I have met Omid previously because Google and Yodely, my company, shared investors. So I'm, I met the folks at Google when the company was very young. And five years later, when I was thinking of going, um, Omid called me and said, come to Google. And so I did know that I wanted to go. I thought I wanted to start another company. And then he called me again later and he said, you know, I know I have an entrepreneurial opportunity for you. I know you want to start another company after Yodely, but the entrepreneurial opportunity is to go. Come help us figure out this space called Local and Maps. Right? Yahoo is a product. There's a product called MapQuest. Google needs a product in local and maps. And in fact, I took a look at the business opportunity, and in two, in two weeks, I went to Google, because I was so clear that there was such an opportunity there. But the most amazing thing Omid did was certainly not hire me. The most amazing thing Omid did was build a team, build a team that was so strong that you look at it in hindsight and you say, wow, he really knew how to hire great talent. So he hired me, but he never stopped himself short of hiring talent that would threaten him, that would, you know, he never worried about that. He just hired the singularly best people he could find. And in fact, it's one of the things that Google is known for. So my peer group included Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, Tim Armstrong, 
CEO of AOL. <laughs> David Rosenblatt, the CEO of a company called DoubleClick, right, that was sold to Google. You know, so when I look at that peer group, first of all, I feel honored to have been in that group. But more importantly, I look at Omid, my boss, and I'm like, my goodness. Never took his eye off hiring the very best talent he could find. And, and, if you, oh, and then he hired another guy, a guy named Nikesh Arora, to run Europe. And Nikesh went on and became Omid's successor. So Omid retired in 2009, and Nikesh, another Indian, you know, became Google's chief revenue officer for four years. He just left. And my boss, Omid, just went back into the driver's seat of Google after being retired and is now the chief business officer again. So he took it from zero to 26 billion, he retired between 26 billion and about 40, and he's back in the driver's seat as the chief business officer. But I look at Omid and I was like, what is it that he did right? And what's really interesting is what he did right is he found great talent. But it's not in the obvious places, and you see that in Silicon Valley. All the people I describe, Tim, Cheryl, myself, David, Nikesh, none of us had ever done the job before they hired us for. How interesting is that? Any of us could legitimately have been his successors. Right. One of us was. Right. The rest all went on to start companies or run big companies. Right. So what did he do right? He focused less on what some of these historical experiences have been, and he focused on their intellect, the diversity of their experiences, and he focused on the very, very best people he could find. And the person I learned that from was him. Next slide, please. So, I'm at Google, I have a fabulous career, and of course I'm itching to be an entrepreneur again, and I'm thinking about what I want to do. Um, and I go to a company called Polyvore, which is a small company in the online space, and shortly thereafter I start my second company, the company I'm running now, called Joyous. And Joyous is at the intersection of video and shopping. Nothing exists like it on the internet. And the closest analogy might be a shopping channel like QVC or HSN. These are multi-billion dollar public companies. But in the world of online video, there's YouTube, and there's a ton of other startups that are doing online video. And there is nothing in shopping around video. No shopping sites that are like shopping channels like you see on television. And so it was probably 2000, early, early, late 2010, early 2011, and I had the idea, late 2010, and I had the idea for Joyous. And I was completely frozen at the idea of starting a company. I did not want to start another company. I'd had all the success at Google. I had since, since left Google, but I was worried about what everyone would think. Because you know, it's really hard to start a company. It may not work. It may still not work. It may fail, right? And now I have some amount of reputation and some amount of ego, right? Ego in it. I can just fail flat out. And in fact, the chances are they're pretty darn high I'm going to fail. And so I was really paralyzed at the idea of starting a company. Everybody thought it would come so naturally to me. People called me a serial entrepreneur. But I was really like, wow, what if I do this and I fail? And I called up a guy named Michael Deary, who's an investor in Joyous. He runs a very successful angel fund in the Valley called Harrison Metal. And I said to Michael, and I talked to Michael about it. I told him about the idea. He was the first person I called. And I was like, am I crazy? Am I crazy to think that one day on, online, people will watch video and buy stuff from it? You know, is that crazy? You know? And he said, you know, he was the person who sort of said to me, when the time I was feeling most anxious, of course, you'll never know until you try, right? And you would think that, you know, after a very successful career in the Valley, I, didn't, I wouldn't need to hear that. But I did. I did. Because at that time, the thing that was keeping me paralyzed was not financial risk. That was my first company, right? But it was ego risk, right? So if what's preventing you from trying something is ego risk, let it go. Because you know what? That's the best kind of risk to take. Right? The risk that isn't worth taking is the risk of regret. The risk that one day you're going to look back at it and think, I should have done it but for the fact that I worried about what other people would think if I failed. And that's what Michael taught me. Next slide, please. So the last two things I want to talk about come from two other, um, two important, two other important people in my life. One is a guy named Anil Aurora. So Anil is the CEO of a company called Gildley, my first company, that he just took public 15 years later. So it went public on the, on the NASDAQ, uh, in Q4 this year. And I'm really proud of the fact that it went public. 
You know, but while I was associated with and I was its founder, I left at year five. He stuck it out till year 15. I live in a world, in Silicon Valley, and maybe some of you do too, who, who are in the IT sector, where in technology in particular, perseverance is very underrated. People are always on to the next hot new thing. But if you look at truly great companies and anything truly great, it takes a tremendous amount of time. And basically, when I look at Anil, you know, I consider myself a founder, but I consider him far more one. Think about the perseverance to stick with that for 15 years, to see it to an outcome. I left at year five. I went to Google, right? And he stayed and he built it, you know, as any founder would do, despite the fact that he wasn't, right, into something great. Next slide, please. So the other important person in my career um, is my Babaji, the man that my father followed for many, many years. Uh, his name is Bai Mahinder Singh Ji, and he runs the Gurnanak Nishkam Sevik Jatha in, uh, in Birmingham, in England. And every year, for twice a year, my parents would take me there growing up. Uh, and he was my father's dear friend before he, in fact, succeeded and became the Babaji for that, uh, for that Gurdwara. Shortly before I started Joyous, I had a company in between, a company called Polyvore, where I was CEO. Polyvore is a thriving company. I quit after six months. I quit for my first CEO job. And I quit because the founder and I didn't get along. We didn't see eye to eye. We wanted to run the company two different ways. And you can imagine that the decision to go to become CEO of somebody else's company and to quit before I started my next company was a very painful decision. Because in fact, that thing we talked about, ego risk, I learned it, right? I left Google, I went to become CEO of somebody else's company and I quit, I failed. So in fact, when I was looking to start Joyous, all I could think is like, wow, what if I have another failure? What's it gonna look like? And in between that, right shortly after Polyvore, I left Polyvore, I was very upset, and uh, Babaji uh, was over in Canada visiting, uh, visiting uh, I think he'd come to New York to come to the UN, and he came up to Canada and was at uh, my family's house. And I had the opportunity to go see him, and he asked me how, he asked me how it was going at Polyvore. And I teared up because I had just left, and it was brutal. And I sat down with him, and he basically said, it'll be okay, it'll be another job, it will all work out, you know, your children need you now. And my son had just been born, he was, uh, his, his name is Kieran, and he was maybe a year old. You know, and, it, and he reminded me of exactly what my father would have said at the same time, which is in my 20s and my 30s, I still thought everything was in my control, despite the fact that my father taught me from a very young age that nothing's in my control and that everything is in God's control. But nonetheless, I'm somebody who puts my head down and I work hard and I believe I can just drive through anything, right? And so I'm reminded again as I have a failure later in my career that in fact, what my father would have said and what my Babaji said are the same thing, which is all you can do is put in the effort. Part of real success is letting go of the outcome. And by the way, I struggle with that very, very much. But I look at the lesson my father taught me and then Babaji as well, and I know, he, I know he has exactly the same message for me, which you can put in everything, and at some point, you just need to let go. And what's gonna happen is gonna happen. And it is the history of both leadership and life. Next slide, please. And so I come back to this, right? When people ask me what grounds me, people talk a lot about, like, where do you get your strength? What is it you wanna do? What do you wanna be known for? I come back to, in fact, the very first role model I had in my life, my father. I told you that he seeded me with a sense that I had something special to contribute. But he also seeded me with a value system that taught me that everything happens for a reason. And that even for me, even in business, there is a higher plan, right? So I believed from a very early age that my way to contribute to the world was through business. I continue to believe that. So when things don't go well, and I get very upset when they don't, the reality is what keeps me stable is in fact all that I owe to my father because I am convinced there's a higher plan and there's something at work that I don't see and that makes it okay, right? And that's how I like, live with the sort of peaks and the valleys of being in business and on being a business leader and all that goes along with that. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna finish up on a couple things because as I said, it was very fun for me to go through this exercise of thinking like, what could I say to you about being an entrepreneur that, or being a leader that's worth saying. And it was fun for me to look back on all of these people in my life, of course, none of whom you know, 
right? None of who many people know. It doesn't matter. I was sort of, I was saying, well, gosh, it's enough to share, is it enough to just share lessons? Because as I look back the thread of, through the thread of those people, I was like, what is that? What is it about them that made them so impactful on my life? And I came to this list. And it's really interesting because for me, you can talk about leadership, but what's even more interesting if you want to talk about real leadership is to talk about character, right? I don't have these, I don't have these things, but they do. And it was the common thread I could find through all of them. Humility, empathy, acceptance. Whenever I was with these people, I felt like not only was I enough, I was more than enough with all my flaws. Right? Presence. Every time I was in the room with them, I never felt like they were thinking about the next thing. Just presence, being present. Right? Patience. I have none, they have a lot. I have none, they have a lot. <laughs> right? And then clarity of purpose. Every time you're in the room with any one of these people, just feel like, ah, they know why they're here. They know what they're here for. They're just so clear. There's no distraction. So as we finish up this, if you go to the next slide, please, I just want to leave you with one final thought, which is it's all well and good to talk about great leadership. And I'm glad you've given me the opportunity to do that today. I'm delighted, in fact, right? And I hope some of what I've said just reminds you of what's important on that leadership journey. But quite frankly, you know, even leadership lessons, even those things are transient, right? Great leaders come from great character, right? And if you have one, you will have the other, right? So if you strive on anything for anything on this list, yes, take all the lessons and those are good reminders and think of them as your checklist. Take those character traits and the people who I admire and use that as your grounding, as your grounding path. Thank you very much.